Good evening, church. Uh, good morning, church. <laughs> it seems like it's been a long day. But I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, this morning and say welcome to Maranatha Baptist Church. And thank God for a, a beautiful crowd and another beautiful day that he's allowed us to see. And I trust that everybody has came out here seeking God's face and his spirit and his guidance. I'm going to read a few verses of scripture. I've been wondering in the last couple of days, you know, this time about, about 2,000 years ago, Christ was getting ready to make his journey to Jerusalem for the Passover. Uh, and I've wondered what he did this week, but he did this week what he'd done all of his life, preaching the word, uh, healing the sick, uh, raising the dead, this was just another week to him, even though he knew he was going to, I started to do what I read something last night. I started to say he was going to his final days, but it wasn't. And the reason I said that is I was researching yesterday and now somebody had written a book, uh, The Final Days of Jesus Christ. And it says, the greatest week for the greatest man that ever lived on this earth. Uh, but he hasn't had a final day. His day, it, well, his life is eternal. So is ours if we follow him. Uh, but this is just one of the days. And uh, this is chap uh, Matthew chapter 26. I'm going to read down, uh, verse 6 down through probably 13. Now when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it on his head. As he sat at meat, but when the disciples saw it, they had in, had indignation, saying, "To what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor." When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, "Why trouble ye the woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me. For you have the poor always with you, but me you have not always. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial." Verily I say unto you, whosoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this, that this woman hath done, be told for her for a memorial. So she was, well, he was, he knew that this was her anointing his body for his burial. Uh, but this is just one of the days of the, the final, the, the, the week before he was crucified. Um, I've got... A few things I need to mention right before we get started in our service. Um, one thing, we're having a deacons meeting this evening at 5 o'clock. Uh, and I would like to thank the deacons, the trustees, the school board members, all the people that has worked so hard in the last few weeks to, to get these things brought together. 
Uh, I'd also like to announce a special business meeting tonight after church service. Uh, prayer meeting Friday. I don't know how many of you have heard, but we had church here this past Friday night uh, that the Spirit met with us, and uh, we didn't want to quit. It was, it was church. We called it a little prayer meeting. We met here for just for prayer, but God showed up, and uh, of course, we was expecting that. We was wanting that, and we had a wonderful time in the Lord. So I would like to invite all of you to that same prayer meeting this coming Friday night. Uh, also remind everybody that we have a sunrise, and I wrote on here, S-O-N, rise. <laughs> sunrise breakfast this coming Sunday morning. The deacons will meet here at about 6 o'clock, and we will prepare breakfast for the church. So everybody that wants to, come out and test our cooking. <laughs> the men in church will be cooking the breakfast. Uh, that don't sound good. Uh, I, want to, I want us to continue to pray for Brother Dick Powell. I think he got to come home yesterday. Uh, still recovering. Brother Charles Watson, he's still fighting the battle. Uh, Frank Kimball, I think he's hadn't heard anything in a few days, but he's still recovering from uh, his foot surgery. Sarah Smith, I think I, I heard she fell and broke a, a kneecap and a little finger. Remember Ann Redden, is a friend of uh, Homer and Sandy Cruz. She's having spinal surgery tomorrow. Uh, I think that's about all the requests. And a, a thank you note from Sister Sarah and Brother Charles Watson. Uh, to my church family, Thank you for all the cards and phone calls. Words cannot express the love and feelings I have for all of the prayers, kindness, and friendship of, a, of Sarah and I. May God richly bless you all, loving our Savior, Charles and Sarah, Philippians 4.13. Uh, we thank you for the nice card, Brother Charles and Sarah. Uh, let's continue to pray for Brother Charles. Uh, you'd have to talk to him to see how much... It hurts him that he can't be here right now. He's uh, fighting this battle, and I think he's going to win it. Continue to pray for him. I think I've rambled enough, so let's go to him in prayer, and uh, we'll start our song service. Most Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before your throne of grace and mercy this morning, thanking you for allowing us just to see another day, Father. Thank you, Father, for your many blessings. Thank you for the privilege and opportunity and the honor of being able to be called the sons of God. We thank you for all of your many blessings. We ask God that you would meet with us here this morning. Uh, help us all to lift up a perfect praise to you. Help us, Lord, to look to you for our guidance. We pray, God, that you would touch Brother Isaac as he come shortly with the word and just sprinkle it with your spirit and your blessings. And, Father, when we walk away from here, we know we'll be able to say it's been good, for it's come from you. Lord, we love you and praise you. Ask these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Let's all turn to page 500 when the roll is called up yonder. Uh, another thing I'd like to say... Uh, we're excited about the bus ministry. Bus ministry, bus ministry is getting ready to start a spring campaign. It will begin next uh, next Sunday. It will run till May the 19th. Our goal in the bus ministry is to reach 40 young children to bring into church for Sunday school and church. The name of this campaign is going to be the Western Roundup, and we just pray that uh, you'll pray for it. I ask you, Lord, that God will just bless us and help us and guide us in everything that we do in the bus ministry. It's turned to 500. When the roll is called up yonder, will you be there? Amen. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair when the same to earth shall gather over on the other shore and the roll is called up yonder i'll be there when the roll is called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder Yeah. 
yonder I'll be there. On that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise and the glory of his resurrection share. When his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the sky, roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Let us labor for the man. From the dawn to setting sun, let us talk of all the wondrous love and care. Then when all our life is over and our work on earth is done, and the road is called up yonder, I'll be there.
Let's turn to page uh, 489. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Just all saying when you find it. Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood. that you've sat down, I'd ask you to stand back up and look at your neighbor and say, welcome to Maranatha. Wasn't that some beautiful singing? Let's give the choir a great big hand.
Just a reminder that uh, this month is still Missions Month, and uh, we talked about this last week, had some wonderful services through Missions Week. Uh, I'd like to remind everybody to still pick up one of these cards if you hadn't already, pray over it, read it, study it, and, and seek God's will, and decide what he wants you to give to the missions. Uh, that's, we separate, uh, or separate, we support well over 100 missionaries throughout the country, throughout the world, really, and this is how we do it, with uh, faith promise from, from you that has promised to help us support these men that's doing a great work throughout the land. Um, I would ask the ushers to come forward. Brother Jeff, would you bless it? Lord, thank you so much for the huge crowd here this morning. Lord, I ask that you, uh, you flow out and just speak to each other. I can hear from you through him. I thank you for the Sunday school lesson we had. Well, we know you're still in control. We thank you for all that you're going to do in our lives as we keep our eyes on you. We ask that you help us as a church and as a school. Be a lot of us continue to be a lot of us in this community. But most of all today, Lord, we ask that you help us to be the soul in the church. Today. Yes, Lord. Keep the great commission that you taught us in your word at the forefront of our ministry. Bless both the gift and the giver. Just uh, like I said, give Isaac the words to give to us today, and we'll lift your name up. We love you, Jesus. Name. Amen. Amen. Today's missions offering is going to go to help ministries to support these missionaries that we just, well, throughout the world. Uh, one of the themes that was preached on here this past week was, is there not a cause? And our cause is to spread the gospel throughout all the world. And another one of the examples they used, we are to be billboards. You know, we, a billboard stands on the side of the hill. It's bold. It doesn't move. And it proclaims what they're trying to sell. We're not trying to sell anything. We're trying to give you Jesus Christ and him crucified for the sins of the world. That whosoever shall believe shall be saved. So uh, this Dollar for Missions offering is going to, to the cause. Uh, I demand to go ahead and Sister Stacy, you make your way up here.
wondered how this holy place could take a man like him with shouts of great rejoicing and with music then they came of the angels standing by him he asked what could be their name these are the company
I believe Isaac's already got the fire started here for him. <laughs> Brother Isaac, God bless you, brother. I think it would be appropriate just to pause what we're doing and pray. Um, would you do that with me, please? Oh, God, surely your presence is in this place. <sighs> Thank you for not sparing your own son and giving him up that he might be the way through the blood, past the veil, into the holy of holies, we have access to you, our creator. And God, you have access to us right now. Remove all distractions, I pray. Thank you for being ready to forgive. A God who delights in mercy. Thank you for saving a sinner such as I. Oh, and I thank you that we can know you're here. And I thank you for allowing us to sense it and to claim it by the truth that's in your word. Take this time, do with it what we cannot. In Christ's name, amen. This is precious, isn't it? Oh, it's beautiful singing. Uh, the choir did an amazing job. I don't know where the choir director went, but you're doing a great job with that group. You're doing a wonderful job. I love that song. I appreciate every single person who's greeted me and my wife and our sweet daughter, Presley. I made a friend today, by the way. His name's Preston up here on the front row. He pointed us out. Now, ushers, whoever's in charge of ushers, if you're looking for a new usher, he's your guy. He pointed us out to the nursery, and I'm really grateful for him. I look out into this audience, and I'm reminded that there's no place like home. I think Dorothy said that first, right? Well, I can borrow her words. There really is no place like home. I look out into this audience and I see a vast multitude of people who've invested in me. I see, quite frankly, the only two pastors I really claim prior to the place my wife and I have been serving at these past few years. Pastor Bill Fox is back here today. For the first 14 years of my life, he was the only pastor I'd ever known. And he wasn't full of this fanciful stuff that this world is encapsulated by today he came and faithfully preached the word of God every Sunday every Wednesday and then I had the privilege of being pastored by my grandfather he's my homiletics professor and uh, he did more of the same expository preaching and I'm grateful I see a basketball coach I had for many years someone who knew me and allowed me to be me and made the most of me and I'm grateful for him now my favorite of all I don't know if you guys know this but I'm actually a lifelong student in a class. I don't know, Sarcasm 101. Have you ever heard of a class like that? <laughs> and uh, my professor, she's been my professor for the past 24 years, almost 25 years of my life now, Delma Vance, <laughs> is somewhere in the back. So she has a lot to do with who I am today. But nobody has as much to do with that as Christ does. And uh, I praise God that I can go in. You know... I've been in North Carolina these past few years, and every single time I'm greeted by someone, they ask me, where are you from? And when I get really excited, when I'm coaching or when I'm teaching, preaching chapel, stuff like that, my accent comes out, and the students will come and try to emulate my accent. Where are you from? Where are you from, people ask. And I'll tell them, well, I'm from West Virginia. And when you give that response, you get typically one of a few responses back. Some of them are kind of mean. You know what I'm talking about. But I've grown to love one of them. They'll say, oh, almost heaven. And I think that's my favorite. And they're taken from that fancy song that we like to claim as our state song, even though it's really not. Almost heaven. And as I began to think about those words, almost heaven, I'm reminded that those could be either the sweetest words that you claim or the saddest and going right along with what the choir has sung and with what my mother has sung, I want us to open God's Word and be finding, please, the New Testament book of Acts. And we'll find the sentiment, the nature of those two words, almost heaven, in our text this morning. Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. And here in Acts chapter 26, Paul 
is delivering what is his longest speech recorded for us in the book of Acts. Now you can praise God, I'm not going to preach all the way through this longest speech. It was so long, as a matter of fact, when he began the introduction of his speech, he sticks out his outstretched arm and he asks the people to bear with him patiently. Do you know somebody like that when they tell a story you've got to be all in the whole time? You know, my grandfather, he's guilty of that. Growing up, we'd sit around the table and he'd be telling a story and my Sarcasm 101 professor would intervene in that story and he would stop what he was saying, he'd wait for her to finish, and then he would probably go back to the beginning and continue that whole story. <laughs> I used to get so annoyed by it until I realized most recently I do the same thing. <laughs> but Paul was having one of those moments. He knew he had something to say. And he's really in court is the setting. And he's in a great audience room at Caesarea. He's surrounded by military men, chests puffed out political powerhouses, chins held high, and Paul of the tribe of Benjamin, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, mocked and ridiculed by many, his Christianity questioned because of the lifestyle he once lived. Paul takes up, stands firmly, and delivers a timeless testimony. And I want us to pick up our reading in verse 24 of chapter 26. And you'll see a response to Paul's testimony. And I think you'll catch a glimpse of someone who was at almost heaven. And as he, Paul, thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. But he said, I'm not mad. Most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. I'd like to read verse 28 for you one more time. And when you read it, I want you to imagine a youthful king full of himself with a snarl on his face who's just heard and seen the gospel and the effects of it. And read it once more with me. Verse 28. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And with God's help, I'd like to preach underneath that familiar saying, Almost heaven. Almost heaven. Here in this story, we find a man who quite literally was as close to heaven as any person could be. And I'm not convinced that among us today there are individuals who are at the very same spiritual juncture of their lives, almost heaven. I want to give you two simple points today, and you can write them down if you'd like, a couple statements to fall underneath them. And as we consider this thought, almost heaven, I'd like to begin with this point. First, notice an open invitation. An open invitation. As the song was sung earlier, you see all these great people, and if we were to align them up, you have the martyrs and you have the prophets, and you think, well, they've, they've earned it. Man, they've proven themselves. And then toward the climax of the song, you see Rahab, David, Mary Magdalene, and Paul, and the thief that died by Christ. Why is it that people like that could get in with people like the martyrs and the prophets? Because there is an open invitation. You see, God is no respecter of persons. And Paul gives to us this open invitation as he begins his testimony in verse 12. Would you look at it with me, please? Look at his personal testimony under this open invitation. Verse 12. Whereupon, Paul speaking now, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, 
I saw in the way a light from heaven. You know his testimony. Above the brightness of the sun, shining out, shining the sun, and shining round about me, and them which journeyed with me. Verse 20, or 14, excuse me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying, I love this, in the Hebrew tongue. Aren't you glad when God speaks to you, you can know what he's saying? Saul. He's going to say it one more time to overcome that stubbornness. Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am, what's the next word, church? Oh, you can do better than that. I've been preaching to children and teenagers the past few years of my life, so you've got to do better than that. Let's try it again. I am that's it. Great job, Preston. I heard you down here, man. And Joseph, I think I may have heard you too. Where are you, buddy? Wave at me. There he is. All right. I didn't know my mom was singing a duet either. Joseph sounded great with her. Paul says in the midst of his testimony, quoting the very words of Christ, perhaps they're red letters in your Acts book there, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. This is his personal testimony we'll dive into. Do you have a testimony? The answer is Yes. You see, a testimony, if you're a Christian, a testimony is just your story from God's perspective, right? And a lot of us don't utilize this gospel testimony the way that God designed it to be used. Do you know the verse? The verse says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. That's talking about your testimony. And when it comes to that open invitation, one of the most effective tools that you and I have as Christians today, if you are a Christian, is in witnessing a testimony. It's a testimony. And Paul is utilizing here to full advantage. But there's something I want you to realize about a testimony before we go farther into what Paul gives to us. A proper testimony directs attention to God. A proper testimony directs attention to God. You see, as he's giving his testimony, it doesn't take him but a few sentences to get to the real person that this story is about. He says, he's quoting Christ, and Christ says, I am Jesus. Look at verse 18. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. We'll study that in a moment. And from the power of Satan unto God. Look at verse 20. He says, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles. Man, he's taking a trip. That they, here we go, should repent and turn to God. God, verse 22, having therefore obtained help of God, verse 23, that Christ should suffer. Understand, please, your testimony is not just really a story about you. Your testimony is a story about the Christ in you. And when you have opportunity, as we all do, to witness, have you considered using your testimony? Maybe there's a family member in your life that you'd feel almost uncomfortable, may I use that word? Uncomfortable witnessing to, giving the gospel to. Let me challenge you. Start it with your testimony. The opportunities I've had to witness to people being trained by my papa and Pastor Bill Fox and others at the schools I've attended. Look, there will be people when you go up to them, may I share something with you about Jesus Christ? You know what the answer might be sometimes? No, 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 no. But you know what I've noticed? Hey, friend. Can I tell you something that happened to me? They really won't say no to that. And you might present the gospel to them. Well, I don't want to believe that archaic book. But when you tell them a present tense story about the eternal God, watch now, they can't argue with that. Because a proper testimony directs attention to God. And Paul wasted no time getting to the person who the testimony is really about. It's not about us getting glory for things we did in our past. It's not about us trying to brag about the sins that we've committed. Be careful, you are guilty of doing it just as much as I am. But it is about the God who came. The God who sought and saved and is transforming you. That's a proper testimony. Would you look at verse 18 again, please? The next thing I'd like for us to realize, verse 18, he's talking about this great purpose to open their eyes 
Paul, why, why did God spend so much time in such a dramatic fashion outshining the sun on a desert road to Damascus as you were seeking to kill his very people? Why in the world would God choose you? Why in the world would God go to that measure? Here's why, verse 18, to open their eyes. That person you're witnessing to is blind. And to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. I love this. That they may receive forgiveness of sins. Does that sound like the gospel to you? That they may receive the forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Jump to verse 23 now. He continues this gospel message. That Christ should suffer. The sinless one, the son of God, God the son, he should suffer? Yes. And that he should be the first and should rise from the dead. Does that sound like the gospel to you? Wait a minute, I thought Paul was giving his testimony. He is. Watch now. A powerful testimony has the gospel weaved throughout it. You see, you've got particular instances in your testimony. Maybe it's the town you grew up in or the family that God ordained you to be a part of. Or maybe it was some sinful lifestyle that you were a part of. And all those things can be essential when presenting your testimony to this person you're witnessing to. But listen, please. The power's not in those things. And Paul, when he's presented an opportunity to defend himself... In court, in this audience room, surrounded by Sadducees, surrounded by military men, surrounded by political powerhouses, even the Tetrarch, King Agrippa, is coming to town, and he's trying to defend himself. No, no. He's more concerned about delivering the gospel than defending himself. And he says, hey, look, you're a sinner. You're spiritually blind. And you live in a life of darkness, in a world enveloped by sinful darkness. But there's hope. That very same sin that you're so enveloped by and that you're so enthralled by in your inner person, in your flesh, Christ came to suffer, to suffer for those sins because the Bible says that the wages of sin is, you tell me, death. That's God's law, not our law. The wages of sin is death. Suffering is necessary because of sin. But God, who is rich in mercy... But God, whose love is without end, sent His Son, His only begotten Son, to suffer. That you could receive forgiveness of sins. That you could turn from darkness to light. That you could turn from misery to joy. That you could turn from temporal, terrible, sinful habits to a lifestyle that is focused on eternity that you could stop setting your affection on the ugly, awful things of this world and you could set your affection on things above. I'm here to tell you today, your testimony, it's not just about you, it's about God. And a powerful testimony has the gospel weaved throughout it. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, are you? For it is the power of God unto salvation. Maybe you've given your testimony before and the person has hardened walls calloused around their hearts. And you tell your story and you tell where you came from and you tell them the lifestyle you lived. Have you tried the gospel within your testimony? Because that gospel, like dynamite, will explode in the heart of that person and break down those calloused walls which will lead them to salvation. A proper testimony directs attention to God. A powerful testimony has the gospel weaved throughout it. But watch now, verse 19. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not, maybe you'd like to underscore this, disobedient unto the heavenly vision. You see, this heavenly vision was not just so that Paul could be saved and enter into heaven someday. This heavenly vision was so that he could see other people be saved here on earth. And I was not a disobedient unto the heavenly vision, verse 20, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem. And throughout all the coasts of Judea, he keeps going, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, listen now, and do works meet for repentance. For by grace are you saved through faith. 
And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Now what is the Bible talking about? Works meet for repentance. Think of it this way. A productive testimony, a productive testimony is both a witness and evidence of God's grace. I'll say that one more time. A productive testimony is both a witness and evidence of God's grace. Just the other day, I love what God has allowed me and my wife to do in serving at Tabernacle in Hickory. I had a third grader come up to me. And I've been preaching through practical Christian living, little questions little Christians might have. And he comes up to me, and he's really just getting ahead of the game because I probably plan on preaching this next week to him. He said, Mr. Young, I said, yes, sir. How can I know that I'm saved? A third grader asking that, that's a profound question, isn't it? It seems simple, but it's awfully profound. And I thank God the Holy Spirit is with me to help me answer those questions. And I'm walking with him out by the lobby of the church and we exit the doors and we turn left and we look to our right and there's this beautiful tree that's one of those like stalwart trees of the campus that if you cut it down, every old person, excuse me, every uh, well-aged person in the church is going to get mad about. So we keep it there. And I say, buddy, you see that tree over there? He said, yeah. I say, you know that tree started as just a little seed? Okay. He probably has no idea where I'm going at this point. And inside of that seed is life. Okay. Now they plant the seed and the roots dig deeply into the soil. And then what sprouts up out of the ground, buddy? He says, the tree. I guess right. And it grows and it grows. And then the leaves come and the fruit develops. Now you tell me, man, I said. How do you know that there was life in that seed? And he's, the tree, the tree. The gospel is like a seed that is planted. And when it's planted in your heart and it's planted on that good soil, that good softened soil, and you receive by faith Jesus Christ as your Savior, watch now, the roots dig deeply into the soil of your heart until eventually, watch, 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 you're not just a witness. You're not just somebody who's seen the Scripture and has seen transforming power in the lives of individuals. You then began to grow and grow and grow until you are evidence of the gospel message you believe. And I want you to know, young man, there is life inside of you if you've believed on Jesus Christ. And he said, oh, how do I know that I'm saved? You'll know when you grow. You'll start to notice the fruit. May I borrow Paul's words? You'll start to notice the works meet for repentance. Amen. That's because a productive testimony, a productive testimony is both a witness I've seen God work in the lives of individuals and evidence. Oh, they've not just worked in my life. God has worked in me of God's grace. That's a personal testimony. Secondly, underneath an open invitation, not only when we present this gospel message and this person's at the almost heaven juncture of their life, can we use a personal testimony? But watch now. We can use, number two, public truth. Public truth. Look at verse 22, would you please? Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both to small and great. Remember, God made this promise to Paul that eventually he would be presenting the gospel to kings and great rulers. He's fulfilling that promise right now. Both to small and great, saying none other things than what? Than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. Isn't that interesting? You're giving the gospel and you might be struggling. I don't know what to say. Say none other things than what the prophets and Moses did say should come. Say what God has already said. You can show them with your life what God has done. And then you just say what God has said. What did he say? Verse 23. That Christ should suffer. And that he should be the first that should rise from the dead. And should show light. Remember, what was it on the road to Damascus that so blinded Paul? You tell me. Light. And now... You see the word again? That, and should show light unto the people. Look at verse 20. He says, but showed first unto them. So Paul had this light that was shown upon him. 
The same light that Christ shone when he was here on earth for 33 and a half years. And now Paul is saying, hey, look, please, this is the light of Scripture. This is the light that cannot be dimmed. And this is a part of that public truth. And it's not just for the Jewish people. Hey, military men, it's not just for you. Hey, political powerhouses, you've earned your way to where you are, but I want you to know that this gospel message isn't just for you. Hey, Sadducees, you don't believe in the resurrection, no? It's necessary, and this message is for you. Hey, hey, what about you? Paul, I persecuted the church. Here in a moment, you see a man, Festus, he says, you're a madman. But Paul said, same word earlier in his testimony, I was mad, a maniac, insane, engulfed by a worldly passion to persecute and kill and slaughter Christ's church that he bled and died for. This message is for all of you. And it's not my message, Paul says. This is a message which has an eternal value to it, an eternal longevity to it. This is a message. Did you know the gospel Christ dying on the cross, that wasn't God's plan B. Have you ever thought about that? Does God know everything, yes or no? Adam and Eve, I'm creating you and into your nostrils the breath of life. A little later on, what are you doing, Adam? You're not supposed to be at that tree. Don't eat the tree. Oh, no, 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 no. That wasn't God when they sinned. He wasn't shocked by their sinful choice. He loved them so much, which I cannot even fathom. God loved us so much that he gives us free will to choose whether to love him back or not. And in his sovereignty and in his providence, he had already prepared the way because he knew what man would choose. You would choose the same thing in that instance. Christ is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. This is the same message. It's not Paul's message. It's God's message. And watch now. It is public truth. And this is what these prophets and Moses have been saying. And it's the same thing that I'm saying, Paul said. But you and I, especially in this day and age, do you believe the scriptures are alive? Do you believe they're quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword? I do. Why is it that we are so silent where scripture is shouting? And yet we'll shout where scripture's silent, won't we? Paul said, this isn't anything which has been hidden. Look at verse 24. And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. You're insane. Much learning doth make thee mad. Verse 25. But he said, I'm not mad, most noble Festus. I love how he maintains respect. When you're giving the gospel, you need to learn not to take rejection personally. In this book, this very book of Acts, God teaches us the principle of shaking the dirt off your shoes when people refuse the gospel. The blood's not on your hands after you've delivered this gospel message. Paul's character is being attacked. Much learning doth make thee mad. You're insane. Wait a moment. Paul doesn't immediately go into it and say, hey, why don't I prove to you I have the equivalent of three or four PhDs. I'm not insane. No, Paul wasn't concerned about defending himself. He was concerned about delivering the gospel message. He says, but I speak forth the words, verse 25, of truth and soberness. Verse 26, for the king knoweth of these things, before whom I also speak freely. See, the king, Agrippa, the man who said, thou almost persuaded me, that's his primary audience right here. Everybody else is just kind of caught in the crossfire. For the king knoweth of these things before whom I also speak freely. King Agrippa was an expert. For I am persuaded that none of these things, pay attention to this, the end of verse 26, none of these things are hidden from him. It's a public truth. For this thing was not done in a corner. It's a public truth. But God commendeth his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know what that literally means, that word commendeth? That means, watch now, we're here and we are the world. We are humankind and we're sitting front row 
waiting to see if this creator God truly loves us. And when the Bible says that God commendeth his love, it's like he did this. He said, okay, you want to see how much I love you? He takes back the curtains, both sides, left and right. He says, I want you to see my son suffering in your place. You want to know how much I love you? I'm willing to see my own son suffer, bleed and die for what you deserve. I've commended my love towards you. I have put it on public display. What about other religions? Mormonism? It's done in a corner. Islam, done in a corner. But God put his love, this public truth, on public display. Verse 26, for the king knoweth of these things. Who's the king? King Agrippa. Now, we don't have time to bounce around scripture, but I just want to give you something that blessed my heart tremendously. King Agrippa, he was what was called a tetrarch of that day, they would divide provinces into specific districts, kind of like some modern movies that you've seen, perhaps. And this King Tetrarch Agrippa was over this specific sanction, and he's rather famous. Now, when we read his name, King Agrippa, that doesn't ring any bells. But if I were to say to you his full name, Herod Agrippa, that might ring a bell. Go back many, many years before King Agrippa you'll see his grandfather, Herod. Herod from the Christmas story? The one who strove to slaughter innocent children with his ultimate goal being to kill Christ. The Herodian lion jumped down. King Agrippa's father murdered James the apostle. And yet... It's an open invitation to King Agrippa himself right here in this very moment. You know what that tells me? Our lineage, our lineage, who we are, where we come from, our lineage doesn't determine salvation. God's love and God's love alone determines salvation. Isn't that wonderful? And it wasn't done in a corner. It's not just for those who have the front row seats. It's done for those who have the back row seats. It's done for those who are the most sinful of sinners. It's done for those who would persecute Christ's church. It's done for those who are stuck in the slums somewhere, living some promiscuous lifestyle that makes us cringe. It's done for those who are the political powerhouses, who live the moral, ethical, upstanding lifestyle. It's done for those who sacrifice their lives overseas for the cause of American freedom. It is done for those regardless of who who they are, where they've come from, the color of their sin, it is a public truth with an open invitation to them. Even Herod. Now this open invitation, I have a question for you. Perhaps you're here today and you're an unbeliever. You're not a Christian. You're close. Will you receive this open invitation. How open is it? As open as Christ could spread his arms on that cross is the same amount of openness it is today. He's not closed off to you. You come unto him in faith, he'll receive you. He's calling right now. But hey, Christian, you've received this open invitation. Are you relaying it? Is the invitation still open? As long as the invitation is open, so should us be relaying that message. Number two, and I'll be done. Not only is there an open invitation in this passage, but there is an obstinate rejection. An obstinate rejection. Verse 28. Then Agrippa, our text verse, said unto Paul, Almost. Mm. That word hits a little differently now, doesn't it? After seeing all that Paul put on public display and in pride, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And when we read this chapter, I'm grateful for the chapter and verse divisions here. When we read this chapter, we like to just focus in on Agrippa's response. But there are really two responses here. Look at verse 24. And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said, who was caught in the crosshairs really, said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. That's response number one. 
Response number two, we just read it, verse 28. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. One of them was wounded and offended. He tried to point the blame at someone else. You are crazy. And then the other one uses this word almost. That word almost, it's kind of got a twofold nature to it. And the way it's used here, it's not used like you would when you're playing horseshoes and you come close to the pen. I'm terrible at horseshoes, by the way. I'm just using it for sake of illustration. That's not how this word almost is used when you come close. This word almost actually has to do with a shot clock timer. And three seconds, two seconds, one second. Almost. In that amount of time, he was that close to becoming a Christian. Yet whether it's the response like Festus who was wounded and tried to flip the blame onto somebody else, you've had that response perhaps, haven't you, when you've witnessed to people? You're insane. I recall my grandfather's testimony. He has a booklet available of it. If you've not read it, I would encourage you to read it. And a part of his testimony, now I'll probably tell it differently. He always tells it in this way that I just can't imitate. But I'm going to try to tell it to you. He, he's given his life over to Christ, and he's going to tell my grandmother, wherever she is. I've kind of lost her now in the thick of the crowd. There she is, way in the back with my beautiful wife. Very good. And he's going up to my grandmother after had just living a terrible lifestyle. And he goes up to her and professes Christ to her. I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Papa, would you tell me, what was Grandma's response in that moment? She said, you're drunk, go to bed. <laughs> so can I say it this way? Much learning doth make thee mad, right? <laughs> but that's a response, an unbelievable response. By the way, he began, the gospel seed was planted, and he eventually grew and grew as a Christian until he pastored the same church for 33-something odd years and was an assistant pastor just down the road for a great man of God. Why is that? It's a public truth. He wasn't just a witness of it. He was evidence of the truth. But these two responses here, oh, you're crazy. They didn't want to take blame. This one, almost thou persuades me. That's not the time for me. I'm not willing to give up this lifestyle I have. No, no, not me. While they seem like two different answers, they're two sides of the same coin. Do you want to know what it is that prevented these people from receiving Christ? One word. Are you ready for it? Pride. And I'm here to tell you today, you're an unbeliever. You've not received Christ. You've heard the gospel message. And the only thing that will prevent you from receiving him is your pride. But did you know, Christian, it's the same pride that prevents us from relaying this message to other people? I've only got a couple minutes. I don't want to waste my time. I've got to get to work. That person over there? Oh, no, no, no. I don't want to get near that person. I might catch something. Oh, no, that would be embarrassing. In front of my family? Ah, I'm not. No, no. The same pride that prevents a lost person from being saved is the very same pride that prevents a saved person from witnessing to the lost. And we see an obstinate rejection. Look at the verse, verse 28. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. He was convicted, but he wasn't convinced of it. You see, the gospel appeals to the whole of man, the spirit, soul, and body. And in his soul and his emotions, he was convicted. His pride was wounded, but his will refused to commit to Christ. He wasn't willing to give up what he had obtained and earned in this lifestyle. He wasn't willing to give up that reputation he had gotten amongst the Jewish people that were so dumbfounded that the very Messiah they studied in the Old Testament was not just a Messiah for them, but was a Messiah for the Gentiles like me and like you. Almost thou persuadest me. You're here today, you're lost. You're listening today, you're lost. May I tell you, there are only two answers, two responses to the gospel message, yes and no. There's no middle ground. There's no, I'll wait until tomorrow. There's, well, maybe later tonight when it's more convenient. No. Christ said, you're either with me, yes, or against me, no. A man whom I love to study after, Warren Wearsby, perhaps you're familiar with his writings and with his commentaries. He's been a great help to me and many others. 
he says he's met a lot of one-third and two-thirds Christians. He said, I've met the people. They've got the facts in their head, one-third. He said, I've met the people. They've got the feelings in their heart, two-thirds. But that doesn't get the job done. It takes 100%. Not just your intellect, not just your emotion, but your will. God loves you so much. Remember Adam? Gave him a choice. You can eat of any tree in the garden, but not this one. And he didn't force him to refuse eating of it. He let him choose. And it requires your will. Now the ball is in your court. Now the invitation is in your hand, lost person. And you can either check, yes, I will receive Christ today. I will place my faith in him. Or you can check, no. There's no waiting until later. Your life is but a vapor. It's here for a little bit and then it vanishes away. Bible says this, that today is the day of salvation. Don't put off in time what you will regret forever in eternity. An obstinate rejection. I love reading after John Bunyan. Are you familiar with that name? Anybody here, John Bunyan? John Bunyan was a Puritan, late 17th century. Fun fact for you, now please don't do it right now, but when I was in college and seminary, we do this thing where they try to, I can hear some snickers in the background now. It's quite humorous. I don't want you to look it up right now. It's embarrassing. We do this thing in the, the school there where I attended that they try to reenact people from history and they try to bring them to life. And so they'll have every year a handful of students dress up as these characters and present their life in a first-person point of view. And I had the privilege, we'll put it that way, of dressing up as John Bunyan wearing stockings behind the pulpit of Temple Baptist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. I had the privilege of reenacting John Bunyan. So I know probably a little too much about John Bunyan, so much that I dressed up as him and acted as him. But he wrote a book in the form of an allegory. And it's just really the gospel and the Christian life throughout it. And he names characters, and the names of those characters have to do with the nature of who they are and their personality. And this name, Obstinate, it's not my word, it's not my name. I actually borrowed it from him. There's a character in this book, Pilgrim's Progress, named Obstinate. And if you'd permit me, I'd like to read just an excerpt of that story that really is just a mirror of King Agrippa's heart. As Christian left the city of destruction, Christian being the main character, the one who accepted Christ, the one who left that worldly lifestyle and that eternal hell that he deserved, as Christian left the city of destruction, he cried, Life, life, eternal life. Many came out mocking him, others threatening him. Then others came out just to see what was going on. Amongst the crowd were two who would bring him home to his family, back to the city of destruction. These two's names were obstinate and pliable. Then Christian asked them why they had come after him. Their response, to persuade you to go back with us. Remember, they're spiritually blind, they're in darkness. But, Christian responded passionately, that is quite impossible. You live in the city of destruction, the place where I also was born. I recognize it to be just that, and dying there will sooner or later sink lower than the grave into a place burning with fire and brimstone. Be content, good neighbors, and go along with me. Then, obstinate became more impatient, showing anger and disdain for Christian's cause. Listen to his response. What? And leave our friends and luxuries behind? Christian responds to defend his actions. Yes, because, I love this, everything you would forsake is not worthy to be compared with even a little of what I'm seeking to enjoy. If you go along with me and obtain it also, you'll do as well as I. There's enough for everyone and more left over where I'm going. Come away with me and see that I'm telling you the truth. Obstinate question. What are the things that you seek since you're leaving all the world to find them? Christian says, I seek an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. And it is laid up safely in heaven to be given at the appropriate time to those who diligently seek it. Read about it here in my book if you would like. Nonsense, said Obstinate. 
Away with your book. Will you go back with us or not? Christian replied with resolve. Not I, because I've put my hand to the plow and am neither looking back nor returning to the city of destruction. After making his decision and convincing his friend to stay in the city of destruction with him, Obstinate says, And I will go back to my place. I'll be no companion of such misled dreamers. May I reword Obstinate's word for you? Christian, thou almost persuadest me to be a Christian. It's not the time. It's not the place. I'm not willing to give up these things. But because of his blindness, because of the darkness around him, he could not see how great of an exchange it would be to give up that sin and sinful lifestyle and take in return Christ's righteousness on your record and a home in heaven someday. I'm here to ask you one question. Are you persuaded? Unbeliever, are you persuaded? Will you trust Christ as your personal Savior today? Christian, are you persuaded? How do I know if I'm persuaded if I'm a Christian? Are you trying to persuade other people? It's an open invitation. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Would you bow your heads with me? Our heads are bowed. No one's stirring around. This is the most serious time in a service. Not because I'm preaching, but because God's public truth was opened and His sweet spirit is prodding at the hearts of these people here today. I just want to reiterate the question. You've come here today, lost person. You've come here today, unbeliever. Not on accident. God in his providence made it so that you could be here. And it wasn't to hear from me. It wasn't to hear from the wonderful singing. It was to hear from him and to receive his open invitation. You're here today and you're lost You don't know Christ. You don't know heaven to be your home when you die. You're spiritually blind. You're spiritually dark. Would you receive Christ today? While our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, no one is looking around here in the auditorium. I just want to ask you, if you're lost, would you raise your hand quickly so I can see it? I'll not call you out. I'll not embarrass you. I just want to pray for you. You say, I'm lost. I'm not a believer. Would you pray for me, preacher? Just slip up your hand. Nobody's going to come to you. Nobody's going to call you out. I'm lost. I'm unsaved. Would you receive him today? Call on him right where you are. Oh, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner, and I know you love me so much to die for my sins. I know you rose from the grave, for your word tells me so. And right now in this moment, I am placing my faith in you. I am trusting you for my salvation. Save me, Lord Jesus. Now I'm speaking to the believers. If you're a Christian, you've called upon Christ for your soul's salvation. Would you slip up your hand just as a testimony to the Lord? You say, I'm a Christian. Keep your hand raised, would you? Thank God right where you are for opening up the invitation to you and making sure that it got to you. Oh, God, thank you for sending your invitation to these people. You may put your hands down. Now, Christian, You've received the invitation, but are you relaying it? Are you giving it out to other people? Remember, it's a public truth. God didn't give us scriptures to keep it a secret. You're responsible. How many of you would say today, I'm a Christian and I'm committing to relaying this message to those around me? Maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a neighbor, maybe it's a coworker, maybe it's just whoever God places in your path. And you'd say, right now, I'm committing this week to relay this gospel message. If that's you, would you raise your hand? I don't want to make you do anything uncomfortable, but if you just raised your hand, I'd like for you to come to this altar and commit it to the Lord. 
The altar's a place to die. The altar's a place to commit yourself to Him afresh and anew. You say, I'm committing to giving the gospel out this week. Come to this altar. Don't commit it to me. Commit it to God. Ask Him to help you. This altar is a place where your affections can die. While these are gathering around the altar, committing this week to the Lord and for His message, I'd be amiss to not ask one more time, are you here and you are lost? Today is the day of salvation. Don't prolong it. Don't put it off or procrastinate it. Receive Christ by faith. Commit to Him. It's a worthy exchange. I'm going to pray, and then I'll ask our song leader to lead us in a hymn of invitation. And those of us who are still praying here at the altar, let's leave them time. Father, thank you for being rich in mercy. full of grace and truth. We thank you for your love that would not let us go, a love that sent your Son to suffer in our place. Now I pray for the lost individuals here. Would you save them? Perhaps you have saved somebody here today. Give them the boldness to come forward and tell somebody. And for the Christians who have committed to giving the gospel this week. Remind them. Prepare the person for them to whom they will speak. Place someone in their path and make it so obvious and give them the boldness to deliver the words of truth and soberness, as did Paul. We commit all this over to you. In Christ Jesus' lovely name, we pray these things. Amen. Would you stand all around as we sing our song of invitation? 204.
wasn't that a wonderful message? Amen. Thinking about that, King Agrippa believed the prophets. And he almost made a decision to go to heaven. But unless he changed later, he went all the way to hell. So I would ask again out on out live stream, if there's someone that God's dealing with their heart, it's, it's not too late. You can still call on him to come into your life. And don't almost make a decision. Make it 100% as he said. And you too can have a home in heaven. <clears throat> I don't think I've, well, I think I've made announcements already this morning. I did forget to ask for visitors, but uh, I don't think other than with Brother Isaac. Yeah. Um, you can whip me after service. <laughs> Sister Priscilla. Joy Fellowship Monday. I forgot that. Um, so choir I did practice choir practice this evening at 5 o'clock. And don't forget we do have a deacon's meeting at 5 o'clock. I've already been whipped for that one, too. Um, I don't think there's any other that has to be mentioned. Special meeting, special meeting tonight after service. Had to do that one. Is all minds clear? Anybody got anything they want to say? It's dismissed in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do come before you this evening or this morning, afternoon, thanking you for the word that you've sent our way. And we pray, Father, that if there was one in our midst that almost made the decision, Father, that before it's everlasting too late, that they will have a change of heart and uh, turn to you for their uh, eternal life. God, and I promise, Lord, that those that changes their, their direction, Father, they'll never miss the things of the, their past. Uh, you put a new heart and a new body in them, Father, and, and uh, the, the past will no longer matter. So we just pray, Father, that you would continue to lead us and guide us in a way that would be pleasing to you. Help us, Father, to be mindful of you in all things that we do, and we'll not fail to give you the praise, for we ask it all in Christ's name, and amen. Wondrous revelation Whosoever